character in S, um, but we don't have any information of T recorded in our UP state. So it's kind of difficult to work with uh, what can we do inside of T um, from there. And remember, we don't have to be linear for the solution. We can go up to O of N M. Um, so it sort of go inward from the ends. But, but what are you doing exactly from, from each direction? Yeah. Because there, there are, of course, like many potential share subsequences, but all varying lengths. And then, you know, because you have to maintain order, like it's hard to keep track. So uh, you have to be specific about what you're doing. So again, like Joe said, it might be easier uh, if instead of trying to manipulate the problem, just try to think of a DP state first. Um, yeah. So also note that, so if your DP state was, example, a DPI, and then you were just looping over S, uh, that gives you O of uh, M time, right? You could do like uh, something, you could work on T once inside that loop or something. Or, or if you had something that was uh, NM in size, then you would have to do something O1 to kind of process that DP state. So I, I think there is a counterexample to like doing sort of the greedy from the left and right, like you're talking about. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there's a counterexample for that. Um, Okay, wait, yeah, I get a card. I want to. Um, is your simple? Um, Mine is very simple. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, so I'm going to type in chat my strings. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to say a lot for the video too. So you have an A and then a bunch of Zs and then a B, and then you have that string reverse. I think that's what uh, AJ just put in. Oh. <laughs> Uh, oh, then the, then the one above that. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, so like for the for the one I said, at least like uh, you would greedily match the A's on the ends, and then you're stuck, right? Because then uh, uh, if you're at the end of one string, then you can't move any forward, and then if you do the reverse, then you're also stuck for the same reason. Um, but then the true answer, of course, match all the Z's together. So uh, Rajat has it. So basically, what you do yeah. is you do DPIJ be the answer for s from i to the end and t from j to the end. Um, so the way we have it on the slides is the reverse of that. So we look at um, s from 0 to i and t from 0 to j. Um, but this is another one of the problems where it doesn't really matter if you start from the beginning or the end, right? Because if you reverse s and t, uh, then the answer stays the same, right? Because you can just reverse their common subsequence and that'll hold. So we can sort of go from either side to get the solution. But yeah, it's the same idea. Um, so basically, the way we compute this state is, uh, so first look at SI and TJ. So if they match, um, then we always want to take them um, as a pair, sort of, in the longest common subsequence. Um, 
because if they don't if they match and you don't take one of them uh you can only hurt yourself right because let's say you don't use um tj because you want to use si further on that's only going to hurt you because you can still only use it once so if they match we always want to take them basically so in that case we have uh dpij equals dpi minus one j minus one plus one right because we basically delete the last characters of uh, s and t so we get i minus one j minus one and then we add one for this new pair that we just added um, otherwise we can't uh take both of them right because um if you take one of them then that means you have to take some character like let's say you take si that means si has to pair up with some character of t that's after j which means we can't match up tj with anything without messing that up so we sort of have to exclude one of si or tj so in that case we just do dpij be the max of basically deleting si from the end or deleting tj from the end does this dp state make sense to everyone Okay, so again, the code for this is basically what we were just talking about. Um, so again, if you're in an invalid state, if your i less than zero, j less than zero, you just return zero. Uh, if you already computed it, you return the dp state again. Um, and then we have the two cases we were talking about. So if we can match them, we return dpij as basically you delete both of them. Otherwise, you take the max of deleting one. Okay, all right, so next problem, gas pipeline. Um, so you're making a pipeline that has to um, go up and sort of be at height two at some positions. And at some positions you can make it either height one or height two. Um, and you also given a cost um, for each unit length of the pipeline and each unit length of these support beams, right? So like, if we look at the pipe going through this square, right? Uh, it goes over by half, then up by one, then over by half. So this counts as two units of pipe, right? But in all, in all these other squares, it's one unit of pipe. So it's not bending, it's only one, but if it is bending, that counts as two. Uh, and then kind of the same idea, if you have a support beam here, this costs one unit, and this would cost two units. Um, and you want to know, given all these positions, all these ones here, where you have to have the pipeline at height two, what is the minimum cost pipeline you can create? Note that uh, if it's at height zero here, we can still have it be height two up here. So the only restriction is it has to be height two above all the ones. But above the zeros, we can do whatever we want. Is the problem statement clear to everyone? Okay. Yeah, so uh, we want a linear time DP for this. Yes, uh, that picture is the solution for that uh, input string. And also given the the values on the left, so the unit cost of yeah. the pipeline is two, and then the vertical support beams cost five each. Because yeah, if you say like extend this up by one, right, then that would cost you an additional five more, um, but it would only save you four, because it's only saving you these two vertical pieces here. Yeah, so Andrew has the right the DP state, so <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, it's it's literally just that. So uh, you're at position i, and also the way we actually did it is that you're coming in from height h. So at i minus one, you took height h, uh, and I'll just explain this in a second. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, what I did is I stored a boolean for up. So it was it's saying did I just come from a position in which I was up, and then my position i. Uh, and then I'm storing in the DP up i. Uh, what is the minimum cost now to reach the end? Uh, so, Joe, can you go to the code? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So 
we didn't explain the bit tricks before, so uh, this will look a little funky. Um, so yeah, um, so in our recursive function, um, actually, so first I should explain, uh, joking back to the picture. Yeah. So um, one thing you can note is that all the horizontal pipes will always cost the same, right? Um, because always I will have to spend uh, n times a to do all the horizontal pipes, and that will not change. The only thing I can change is the vertical uh, pipeline and the vertical support beams. Uh, and also for the vertical support beams, um, there will always be at least n plus one of them. And then if I'm up, then I will have a one extra one at that position. All right? So does that make sense? So like, there's always the initial cost of some pipeline and some vertical support beams. Right. Uh, so then if you can see uh, in my last line, uh, I'm printing uh, the answer plus n times a plus n plus 1 times b. Um, so that is just the extra stuff that's always there. Now for the actual dp, um, so what I have there is um, that tilde operator. Um, so this is a kind of nice operator that works on minus 1 in a special way. So uh, if it's minus 1, um, uh, tilde of minus 1 would be false. Uh, but otherwise, it would always be true. So basically, if I have seen this DP state, uh, I can just return it like that. Uh, the reason we do this is not anything special other than it just saves a few characters while typing. Um, yeah, so th that's basically just checking DP, IJ, or whatever doesn't equal negative 1. Yeah. And uh, the reason that tilde of negative 1 is 0 and tilde of anything else isn't is basically what it does is it flips all the bits in the number. So negative one, the way it's represented, is just a series of all ones. Um, so by flipping all the bits, it turns it into zero. Yeah, and then zero is evaluated into a Boolean expression. Yeah. All right, um, I also have some more funky things going on. But um, so yeah, so if i is equal to n, then we've reached the end. Um, and I want to just know, am I coming from an up position or a down position? So if I'm coming from an up position, then I have to move down, right? Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm doing a times up. So that's just saying if up is true, then I will have to incur the cost of a to move down. Um, so what I'm doing there is I'm casting a boolean into an integer, uh, uh, not explicitly. Um, OK. And then otherwise, um, I want to check what are my two choices, basically. Do I want the i position to be up or down? Um, so in the first line there, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to make it up. So I do a times 1 minus up. So that's basically just flipping it. So I might have to do the vertical pipeline, or I might not have to, depending on what up is. And then since I am up, I will incur a cost of b to do an extra vertical support pipe. Um, and then I do my recursive call. So up is true, because this choice is going up, and I move forward by 1. And then otherwise, uh, I want to see, can I go down? So um, Joe, can you go back to the picture real quick? Yeah. Yeah, so um, so if I'm at a particular index, um, I see that um, if either my left or my right is a 1, then I have to be up, right? Because I have to get over the next guy that's up, or I was just, like, I have to be up because the guy before me was just a 1. Uh, so can you go back to the code? So if both of them are zeros, that means I can be down. Uh, so in that case, I can choose to be down. And then uh, I do my cost is a times up, which is just, again, the pipeline uh, moving down. Um, and then I call my recursive function. This time it's false because I wasn't up, and I move forward by 1. And then I return that dp. So yeah, a bit of like bit hacking in here, which is kind of common uh, once you reach a certain point. It saves characters, and it just feels natural. So any questions on how this code is working? I know it's a little bit confusing. OK, I guess we can move on. Yeah. All right, so next problem is plates. So you're given n stacks of k plates each, where every plate has some beauty value. And you want to take exactly p plates with the maximal sum of beauty. But if you take a plate, you have to take all the plates on top of it. Um, so we want a NPK DP solution. So is the problem clear to everyone? 
So like you have this stack of plates, um, and you can't take any of the plates without taking any of the ones on top, and which is like independent for each stack, right? So. Any questions on the problem statement? Give you guys a couple minutes to think about that. You can only take P plates in total. Yeah, you want to take exactly P. <clears throat> And this is another one to pay attention to the constraints because you have um, a lot of freedom with, with what to put in your state uh, given this complexity here. So we have NPK. So one kind of theme that we've been seeing is that uh, when we're at a certain point in solving the problem, uh, we need, sometimes need some amount of information. What, I, what did I do in the past that's going to influence what I'm able to do now? Or... DPP equals max value with P plates left. Um, so P is already a variable that we're using. So I'm just going to call it I instead. So max value with I plates left. Um, it's, it's very close. I, I think you might have it, but like a slight tweak. Um, so rather than sort of storing an array of all the stacks we've looked at so far, uh, we can say we've looked at all the stacks from the first one up to the ith one, for example, or I guess the jth one because using i for plates. But yeah, th that's basically it. So what you do is um, sort of put everything into the DP state. So DPIJ is if we're starting at the ith stack and going to the end, um, given that we've already chosen J plates, what is the max beauty we can get? Um, and the way we get this is by basically iterating over um, all possible numbers of plates we can um, take at this stack. Right, so you can take, Wait. say, yeah. uh, so Andrew, I think you're a little bit confused. Um, so, uh, IJ, so I is saying that we're on the I stack, um, and that I've already chosen, like in the previous I minus one, uh, stacks, I've already chosen J things. Okay, I mean, what I did in the past was so far I've chosen J plates that I thought were good, and uh, now I'm on the I thing, and uh, I need to choose uh, my remaining uh, P minus J plates. This is another one where you can like kind of flip around a lot of what you're doing. So you can like sort of reverse the order of stacks you go through or like do DP of the number of plates you can take rather than the number of plates we've taken so far. So you can do stuff like that and reverse it. 
um, but it'll give you the same answer. So any of those answers would work, basically. But yeah, so in this specific one, what we're doing is we're uh, starting from the i position, um, going onwards. Um, given that we've already chosen j plates, what's the best we can do? And each of these states is going to take O of k to compute, because we have to check what happens if we take 0 at this point or 1 at this point all the way up to k at this point. Right? Because at the given, at the stack you're on, you have basically k options for what you can do. So we're going to try all of those, basically. And so because we have np states, um, this gives us uh, O of npk runtime. The questions on this dp state? So just so, just to just make it a little bit more clear. Um, so this we chose this TP state in particular because it's the information that uh, tells us like what we know so far in solving the problem, right? So I know that I've I've seen like the previous i minus one uh, uh, stacks, right? And I've chosen some amount from them. I chose j from them. Now what's left? Like what what is the problem that's left? Um, so it, it yeah yeah. So here is the code. Um, so again, we're using the trick uh, for not equals negative one here. Uh, so I think I was asking, what is k? k is the number of plates in each stack. Yeah. And um, n is the number of stacks. Yeah. So here, if i equals n, um, if j equals p, then that means we've taken all the plates we need to take. So the answer is 0. But if j is not p, um, then that means we haven't taken all the plates we need to. So we just make the answer some really big negative number. Um, I think in this case, uh, you'd actually be fine if you just return 0. Because uh, if you take less than p plates, then your answer will be less anyway. That's true. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's just making sure that we don't take less than p plates. And uh, then what we do is, as we iterate through the number of plates we take, we're going to maintain the sum of the plates we've seen. So basically, this sum is like a prefix sum up to that point on the plates. So it's like basically the sum of the first L plates when you get here. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying, if we take L plates, what would the answer be? So it would be the sum of all the plates we've seen so far. Um, and then we move on to the next stack and we've taken j plus l plates. And the other constraints on l we have are l has to be at most k and has to be at most p minus j. Because you can't take more than k because you only have k per stack. And you can't take more than p minus j because you can only take p in total. And we've already taken j. And then after we do this, we add the value of the current plate to the sum. Okay. A uh, minor thing to point out, uh, you might be concerned about the sum plus equals plate IL because L can go out of bounds uh, at the very last iteration. Uh, in C++, it's not actually a problem. Like it might access like some random memory and like sum would become like some random value, but on the last iteration, you're not going to use sum anymore. So that's okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and plate is like, yeah. We have like an extra 10 or whatever there. So it's oh, fine. yeah. So it's like maybe it's going to access like a zero, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next problem array walk. Um, so you're given an array A of n integers, and you're going to start at the first element and do k moves left or right. Um, and k is at most n minus one, which basically just makes it a little bit easier in the end, but we'll get to that. So basically, when, you, when you're on position i, you gain ai points. So you initially gain like a0 points, because you're staying on a0. And then every time you make a move, you get points equal to uh, ai for the square you just moved on to. And additionally, you're given that you can only move left um, at most z times. And z is at most 5, which is very important. And you can't move left twice in a row. So what is the maximum score you can achieve? 
So one quick example for this. Uh, let's say we had n equals 5, k equals 4, z equals 1, and our array was 1, 5, 4, 3, 2. Uh, so we, we have to make four moves, and we can only make one left move. Uh, so the optimal sequence of moves here would be, first, you gain one point for your start position, because you start on one. Then we move right to the five, we get five points. We move right again to the four, we get four points. We move left back to the five, we get five points. And we move right uh, back onto the four, and we get four points. So in total, you get 19. And again, the important rules are you can't move left more than Z times, and you can't move left twice in a row. So how would you solve this problem? And the, the goal is we want an, we want a linear time solution. Um, but again, you can have constant factors on that. So this one is another case of basically see how much you can put into the DP state. Um, yeah, so that's on the right track. So, uh, J is... uh, so do you mean J is a number of because if i is your position and j is your number of moves, right, this would become n squared. Uh, uh, so yeah. you didn't mention it, but you want to be around O of n, actually. Uh, can we make the assumption that, so like, say I'm at position i in the middle of the array. It, can I make the assumption that if I move left, I would always want to pick the largest number to my left, and that if I move right, I would always want to pick the largest number to my right? Or is that not a proper assumption to make? When you when you move left and right, you move by one position. Oh. So you, oh, you, don't, yeah. you don't choose arbitrarily. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in, this is a bad example, because in this case, you are basically doing it greedily. Um, but yeah, you can only move by one step at a time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I, I think you're on the right track. So you're doing a DP on number of moves and uh, K, so the number of lefts. Um, but there's more information you need to. Right, because if you just look at number of moves and number of lefts you've done, that's not going to guarantee that you don't move left twice in a row. So how, how could you guarantee this in addition? I mean, you're very close. Um, it would be hard to move outside the DP just because uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, Jason has it. Basically, keep track of what was the last move you made. So was the last move you did a left or a right? And so if the last move you did was a left, you can't move left now. Yeah. OK, so now our DP state has three things in it. Um, so DP IJ left is we've made I moves. Uh, we have J left moves remaining. And left is true if we just move left, All right? So this is zero or one based on whether our last move was to the left or to the right. And so now, uh, given this, we can figure out what states we would reach if we move right, uh, and also what state, state we would reach if we move left, uh, if that's like possible. Because there's a, a couple of conditions where you're not allowed to move left. Um, so we'll go through all that in the code. 
So basically, um, we do the negative one check again. Um, and then first, we want to find what position we're at, right? Because we haven't stored what position we're at. We just have number of moves, number of left moves, uh, number of left moves remaining, um, and was our last move to the left. So we can get our position by taking um, number of moves to the right minus the number of moves to the left times two. All right, so we had, all right, number, not number of moves to the right, number of moves in total minus two times number of moves to the left. And the reason that works is because that's basically number of moves to the right minus number of moves to the left. Because each move to the right is a plus one, each move to the left is a minus one for position. So if you do right minus left, which is the same as total minus two times left, that's your position. Um, and then if I equals K, uh, so if we've made K moves, then we're done. So we just return the A value of the position we're currently on. Um, otherwise, um, if we can move to the left, which is true if we didn't move to the left last turn, and pause is true, which means we are not on the first position, um, and J is at least one, so we have at least one left move remaining. Uh, so if all three of these things hold, then we can move to the left. And so we do that by taking a pos uh, plus uh, r i plus one, because we have one more, we just did one more move, right? Uh, j minus one, because we just used up one of our remaining lefts. And left is true, because we just moved to the left. Uh, and then the only condition for moving to the right um, is if the position is not n minus one. And it turns out that this will always be true wait, 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 uh, because wait, wait. k is at most n minus one. Joe, watch the express escape. <laughs> Boom, fixed. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Insane. I, I took a screenshot of the background and pasted it over this statement because I realized it was erroneous or extraneous. <laughs> Insane. All right. Um, yeah, so we don't actually need to check anything there because K is at most N minus one. Uh, so that means we're never gonna go past the right side of the array. Cause even if we go only to the right, uh, we're gonna stop at the last position. We can never go past that. So yeah, so in this case, we basically see what's the answer if we move to the right. So we do um, DP of IJ left is max of DP of IJ left and the state we reach if we go to the right. So we add the value for this position. Um, and then again, we're adding a move, uh, but we're not using a left. So we don't decrease J and we're not going left. So left is false here. Okay, uh, questions on this approach? Oh, yes, that would work. Yeah. So. Uh, what you can also do is represent every left move as a left and then a right. So whenever you do a left, instead of just doing one step, uh, if you do two steps, that works. Uh, yeah, that's good. Um, nice. oh, also, another thing to note is that uh, what is actually wrong with your thing is not the time, right? Because if you notice, the number of states you actually visit is fine, right? For example, you would never uh, visit like uh, Sorry, I don't forget, I don't remember your exact state, but basically, like it's not possible to visit a lot of the states. Uh, the real problem is the memory, right? Because you're storing n squared memory, and that would like just MLE, or it wouldn't even like run, right? Um, so what you can do to get around that is instead of using an array, you can use a map. So the map would actually just count which keys, or rather, which states you've seen. Um, so that would work. Okay. Um, any other questions on this? Okay. All right. So before we get into our last problem, uh, we're gonna quickly define bitwise XOR. Um, so basically to find bitwise XOR of two numbers A and B, uh, if you write them in binary and then uh, sort of line them up, uh, the bitwise XOR A and B is gonna be all of the positions where uh, their values are different. So for example, if you have A and B here, uh, if you look at their bitwise XOR, 
Uh, the first position is zero because these are both one. Second position is one because they're different. Here they're both zero, so that's zero. Here they're both one, so that's zero. And so on until the end. Um, so you don't need to know too much about bitwise XOR. Actually, I don't know if you have to know really anything about it for this specific problem, uh, but it's the useful thing to know. And one important thing to notice is that A, X, or A is zero for any A. And this is uh, built in to basically all the languages, so Java, C++, Python, uh, using the caret operator. OK. So now the actual problem. Uh, you're given an array B and a function that takes in an array uh, and gives you a number. Uh, so basically the way this works is if you give it an array of size one, it'll just return that one element. Otherwise, it will look at um, sort of all the pairwise XORs of adjacent elements and turn that into its own array and call F on that. So basically what this is doing is you start out with n elements, right? And then this is going to turn it into an array of size n minus 1, where each element is the XOR of two adjacent elements in the previous array. And now we call f on that. And we keep iterating down until we reach a single element and we return that single element. Um, and so for the actual problem, you're given a bunch of queries of the form lr. And for each query, you want to print out the maximum value of a subarray of B that sort of fits inside B L R. And we want n squared runtime. So this is a very confusing uh, problem statement. So we're going to get into an example. So OK, uh, this pyramid sort of shows you how it works, kind of. Um, so this down here is our original array. So this represents like B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, B7. And then every time we call F, we reduce it to the array on top. Until finally we get up to this, which is just an array with a single value. Uh, so we just return this single value. And so the way I've written it out is if you have numbers next to each other, uh, like 1, 2, 5, 6 represents B1, XOR, B2, XOR, B5, XOR, B6. OK, so basically, you can see on the first level, um, it turns 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 into all these pairwise XORs, right? And then on the next level, we sort of do that same thing here. Um, so this would become 1 XOR 2, XOR 2, XOR 3. But uh, note that because 2 XOR 2 is 0, we can sort of cancel the 2s. And this just becomes 1, 3. Oh, uh also, the ZOR operator is commutative, so I can change yes. the order in which I'm doing any of these things. Yeah. Uh, so if, if the same number appears twice anywhere in there, then I can just cancel it out. Yeah. So as we work up, uh, that's basically all we're doing is, like, if you look at, like, 2, 4, 3, 5, we just combine everything and delete the duplicates. And then 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, we combine and delete the duplicates. And that just leaves us with 2, 6 here until we reach the top, which is 1, 3, 5, 7. So does everyone like kind of see what's going on here? It, it turns out you don't really need to know much about XOR to solve this problem. So you could try to like look at this uh, pyramid and like try to find the patterns. Um, and there might be some pattern there, but if you use DP, it gets significantly easier. So uh, kind of similarly to what we did with the palindrome problem last week, we're going to sort of split this up into two parts. Um, so for the first part, we want to compute f of a for all subarrays of b. All right, so again, here's the definition of f. Um, so we're not looking for like a subarray inside of a or anything like that. All we want is compute f of a for all subarrays of b. And we want some kind of n squared dp.
So this picture, um, I think it can be kind of helpful to um, figure out the DP for this because the DP is like kind of hidden in this picture. Um, but again, it's not anything like you have to like search for some like pattern and like how many numbers are on each row or something. Um, uh, I, I actually, for me, when I had written out this pyramid, I, I had thought, uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't look at the pyramid. Maybe I should analyze differently. I mean, so I mean, yeah, you can, maybe there's two ways of approaching it. I mean, the DP is like kind of inside the pyramid a little bit. I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, th this might not be the most intuitive way to think about it. So you can also think about it in other ways too. So basically the idea I was going for is like, can we turn every element in this pyramid into a DP state? And then like, how would that work? I think I guess what I was saying is like kind of a hint that uh, don't get too caught up in like the numbers that you're seeing because like yeah. what I was trying to do was like find like some pattern. I was like, oh, like the four is repeat every so often or something. Yeah, don't try to do that. Um, yeah. Just realize that like there are like actual numbers that you like did soar on them. Yes, uh, so you have it. So basically, uh, the thing to notice is that each of these values is FLR uh, for some uh, LR in the array, right? So like, let's look at the top here. So this would be F17, right? Because that's how we defined it. Uh, it turns out this would actually be F16. Because if you imagine like, if we delete seven from the bottom here and we only look at one to six, that would create a pyramid that goes up to one, two, five, six. Right, so this is this is the answer for one through six. Um, and similarly, if we sort of cut one out and we look only at two through seven, um, this is the answer for two through seven. So because we know that um, this value here is the XOR of these two values, we can just take these the XOR of these two to get this. And in general, for any of these, um, to find the value, all you have to do is take the XOR of the two things below it. Right, so that gives us a DP state uh, here. So DP LR is just DP L R minus one XOR D P uh, L plus one to R, like what Scott was saying. So I mean, if you draw those pyramids, right, you quite literally have overlapping some problems. Which is kind of nice. Yeah, you're basically drawing out the DP table with that. Um, so the code for this is uh, pretty simple. So if L equals R, then the answer is just AL, right? Because your array is one number. Uh, otherwise, if you've already calculated it, uh, just return that. And then, yeah, all you have to do is return the XOR of the two states below it, basically. So if you cut out the leftmost one, and if you cut out the rightmost one, and you XOR those together. Did you call the function RR so you could use R as a parameter? Oh, yes, uh, that, that's another thing. Um, yeah, this is only called RR just because this is R, so we can't have both of them be R. <laughs> this is the one way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now we have that part of the problem solved. We have FLR for all L and R. So now we have a much more general problem um, that you don't even need to think about XOR at all for. Um, so this is just kind of a general problem. Uh, Given L and R, what is the max value of FAB 
where AB is a subarray of LR. And again, don't think about XOR or anything like that. That part's done. Um, also, just just to be clear, uh, subarray is not the same as subsequence. So it's like a continuous yes. block that fits inside of the, se the segment from LR. Yeah. And one hint for this is the idea for this is going to be uh, kind of similar to what we did for longest common subsequence. There's, there's some differences, but it's going to be kind of along the same lines. So at this point, you can even think of FLR as like some random values that like you're given. Like you could think about it as like any arbitrary array. Um, and then how do we get the next? Um, so we don't want like the max sum, we want like the max value for any subarray inside L to R. We're applying the function to the subarray, not picking right. that out of the subarray. So it's basically look at all the um, subarrays that fit inside L to R. And we take the max over those of the f values. So we're looking at like some subset of the values in the array, and we want the maximum. So the DP state for this um, is going to be basically just like DP LR again, right? So we want like the DP value for every L and R. Um, so then how do you compute that from the other DP values? Are the two uh, values just equal? Um, no, so you'll get different values based on what subarray you take. Right, because you could get like any of these different values just by taking some subarray. So like let's say you did one to seven um, as your range, your answer would be whatever the maximum of these values are in like the whole pyramid. So you could have a whole bunch of different values in there. Are you guys maybe confused on like yeah. what you're asking? So um so like, for example, let's say my query is like, uh, like can you go to the pyramid? Yep. Um, so if my query is like uh, three, six, right? My L is three and my R is six. Um, so my answer would be the maximum value that appears anywhere in that sub pyramid that Joe is like highlighting with this uh, pointer. And the reason for that is for example, like, uh, let's say I want to get the number represented by B4, X, or B5, then I would pick A is equal to 4 and B is equal to 5, right? So that I would apply F to B4, B5, and then I would get uh, B4, X, or B5. So any any value that appears in that sub-pyramid, um, I can like find the A and B that corresponds to like zoring up to getting that value. So then my queries are asking, 
uh, okay, fine, in this pyramid, what is the largest number that appears at all? Right. Yeah. We have the pyramid. Now the question is, how do I just get the largest number that appears in the sub pyramid? Oh, uh, yeah. So for this part of the solution, f basically doesn't really matter. You can think about f as like um, any sort of value, like any sort of arbitrary array for like f l r. But um, basically, what it does is like if you look at f one to seven, it does like this recursive XORing all the way up until you get down to a single number here. So it's doing it's doing this. But again, for this uh, second part, now that we've computed FLR for everything, uh, we can just think about it as arbitrary values. And now we want, given some point here, what's the maximum value in the pyramid? So this picture might actually be helpful to have for this part too. Because now what we're trying to do is say, um, at any point, we want to uh, store what's the maximum value in the pyramid below it. I think there have been many, many hard DP problems in this lecture so far, so maybe we should just give the answer. <laughs> it has been enough. Yeah, OK. Let's, let's get this. So basically, uh, the idea is, let's say we're like here or up here. So if we want the maximum value in this whole pyramid, uh, that's either going to be the root, right? Or it lies in this pyramid, like the left child, basically. Uh, or it lies in this pyramid. So what we can do is take the max in this pyramid and the max in this pyramid and this value and XOR them all together. Or not XOR them all together. Take the max out of those three numbers. And that will be the answer here. And so to compute this, we just sort of recursively do it again. We look at the max here and the max here and this value. Um, so what the DP state looks like is So uh, dp2, because we already have dp of L of r, L and r is um, the max value inside LR. Uh, so you can also think about this as whether or not we're keeping L and r in our max subarray. So if we keep them both, then the answer is just dp LR, right? So it's the value in, it's the value of the subarray LR. If we only take L and we leave out r, then the answer is dp2 of l r minus one. Um, and actually, we're, we're not necessarily taking l here. But this is, we're looking at a subarray of l to r minus one. And this is, we're looking at a subarray of l plus one to r. And you might think you also have to like cut out both of them, but that would be covered by both of these, right? Because l plus one r minus one lies inside both of these intervals. But again, a more intuitive way to think about it might be think about it in terms of the pyramid, right? And you just take uh, max in the left child, max in the right child, and the value itself. And so the way we write the code for that is this. So this is the function we had before. This is what computes f. Um, and then this is what gives you the max on uh, every interval. So again, it's itself. Um, and then, oh wait, this is backwards. This should be RR and these two are RR2. But it's the F value of itself and then the left child and the right child. Or the, the left child is here and the right child is here. Any questions on this? Probably not the easiest problem to follow along with, but. Yeah. The nice part about this problem is you don't need to do too much with XOR. It, initially, it seems like you have to like dig through the pyramid to find all the patterns. But um, yeah, OK, so an example. Um, OK, so 
Oh, uh, let's do a short example. If we do more than like four elements, this is gonna be hard. But here. Okay. So let's say that our values were like one, three, four, one. Um, I'm going to make this one, three, two, one. So I have less bits to think about. Okay. So um, if we run F on this and we take the pairwise XOR of everything, this is going to turn into two, one, three. Like, because you XOR one and three, you get two, three and two, you get one, two and one, you get three. Um, and then if we run it on this, we're going to get three, two, and then one. You do that so fast. There, there's two bits. It's fine. You're right, Ellen. Okay. Um, so this this would be our pyramid, right? And then what we want to do for queries is, for every query, we're given some element of this pyramid, and we want to know what's the max in the sub pyramid here, because every element here represents a subarray of this subarray, basically, right? Because this represents one to three. And for example, this represents one to two, right? And like this would represent just the element two. So what we want is, okay, so first of all, for the first part of the DP, all we're doing is um, for every DP state, we're just XORing the two below it to get it. And we just do this for everything. Okay, so every element in the pyramid, we do that. Now for the second DP, what we want is the max value in every pyramid. And the way we do that is um, we look at, so initially the, the max value in these is just itself because there's only one element there. And then for every other element, we're gonna look at the max to the left, the max to the right and its own value. And we're gonna take the max of all of those. Um, so in this case, it's three. This is a bad example because everything's going to be three. Um, but yeah, so what we're doing is you take the max of this value, this value, and this value. And then we do the same thing like here. So we get three. Same thing here. And if we keep iterating up like this, again, this is a bad example. Everything's three. But now uh, if you want to query on LR, you just find what element it corresponds to in this pyramid, um, and you just print out this value. Is that clear? Any questions? Yeah, you know, you're given like some uh, arbitrary array. It's not like a subset of another one. Uh, any other questions on this? Okay. Um, I think it was this one. All right. Uh, so that was all we had. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, these slides are in the info channel if you guys want to go through them. Uh, and we'll post the recording soon. Um, so Wednesday, we're going to be doing another DP contest. Um, so hopefully we see you guys there.